You're listening to the FQXI podcast. Today. We remember the past and not the future. If you play a movie backwards, any everyday scene, it looks preposterous, everybody laughs. And so there's an asymmetry of the world in time. And then there's this psychological impression we all have that time is flowing or moving. The arrow of time. The best known example of that is Stephen Hawking's quantum black hole. Black holes are not totally black. According to Hawking, they emit radiation and they get hotter as they emit energy. So gravitation goes back to front. And that's the key to understanding the origin of the arrow of time. Paul Davis on black holes, the end of the universe, and why we can only move forwards in time and never back. And that was for me the aha moment. It's that the star collapses, it implodes catastrophically and disrupts the quantum vacuum forever and ever. So it's like the grin of the Cheshire Cat. It lives on for trillions upon trillions of years, that initial disruption. That's what gives you the arrow of time. I'm Zia Morali. Hello and welcome to the podcast from the Foundational Questions Institute. This is the second part of our series on irreversibility, in this case, writ large across the cosmos. Why does time flow in only one direction? Why do we grow older, never younger? Many physicists relate time's arrow to entropy, a measure of disorder. But if that's so, how did the universe seem to move towards more order with the formation of galaxies and planets? To answer those questions and more, Reporter Logan Chipkin spoke with physicist Paul Davis of Arizona State University in Tucson as part of a special series of conversations that he produced with FQXI physicist Chiara Marletto. The conversation covers the role of gravity in constructing time's arrow, exemplified by black holes. They also discuss the black hole information paradox, and Davis recalls attending Stephen Hawking's seminal lecture on the idea that black holes aren't really so black, but slowly radiate energy. And they chat about the idea that information can be used as a fuel, a concept that many regular listeners will know is now being exploited to build better nano devices. But as Davis notes, nature got there first. And finally, there's a sociological turn. Could universities be improved or not? All right, I'm here with Paul Davies. Paul, thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure. We're going to talk about several topics today. It's not going to be quite a deep dive in any particular topic, but we'll definitely run the gamut as best we can. So to start off, why does it seem that time has a directionality to it? Well, in daily life, we're in no doubt that the past is different from the future. And this impacts on us in two quite different ways that often get conflated. One of these is people will say time passes or they'll talk about the river of time or the flow of time, nothing we can do to halt that. It seems to be our most primitive experience that time is flowing or moving or we're being conveyed along in some manner. I'll come back to that because the other thing which is not quite so subjective is that we remember the past and not the future. We find traces and records of the past, but not of the future. And if you play a movie backwards, any everyday scene, it looks preposterous, everybody laughs, because what you see is seemingly impossible things, like eggs reassembling themselves, or rivers flowing uphill, or footprints coming into existence on the beach by the retreating tide. Things like that look impossible. And so there's an asymmetry of the world in time. And then there's this psychological impression we all have that time is flowing or moving. And these two things tend to be lumped together. I think they're distinct, but they tend to be lumped together and are given the term the arrow of time. But I like to make this distinction that between the flow of time and the asymmetry of the world in time, I think they are distinct things. So obviously, connected. Going on this point, you once wrote that the arrow of time describes a property of the world in relation to time. 
rather than a property of time itself. So why is this an important distinction? Uh, yes, it's absolutely important. A lot of people simply get these things muddled up. I got it straightened out very early in my career when I was trying to pick my way through this complicated mix of topics. When you look at the laws of physics, they have time in it. With the exception of some obscure processes in particle physics that I won't talk about, these laws are symmetric in time and there's nothing in those laws to pick out, as it were, a present moment, uh, something that we might call now. Time is simply there as a parameter, just like space. And, of course, we can say that we have a location in space and a location in time, but these are properties of us, not properties of space itself or time itself. And so I think that is a really important distinction because, well, let me first say, that this metaphor of the arrow can be very confusing because there are two ways in which we can think about arrows in daily life. One is firing an arrow from a bow and off it goes. And so it's the velocity of the arrow which is impressing itself upon us. And so when a lot of people talk about the arrow of time, they think of the velocity of time or the flow of time until they stop to think, well, how fast is that? How fast is the arrow going? Well, it's going at one second per second. And that's just a, a tautology. It tells you nothing at all. But there's another metaphor of an arrow, which is closer to what I think is the objective reality, and that is the arrow on a compass or a weather vane. It points in a particular direction, like north, in the case of the compass, but that doesn't mean you're moving to the north. It just means that's the direction of the north. And the arrow of time tells us that there's a directionality facing the future and facing the past uh, look different. They are different. The world is constructed in such a way that future-facing and past-facing observations are distinct. But that doesn't say that time has got to flow or move from the past to the future or whatever sort of metaphor that you, you want to apply. Of course, that leaves open the question of why is it we have this overwhelming impression that time is flowing, passing. Where does that come from? And that's a separate set of issues having to do with human psychology and memory and whatnot. I think that is a subjective thing. It's a real phenomenon, but it's in our heads. It's not something in the world outside. So time itself isn't going anywhere. It's uh, just like space isn't going anywhere. It's just there. Talking about the objective directionality of the history of the universe, correct me if I'm wrong, but data indicate that only a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the universe was a pretty homogenous, maybe boring place. Whereas now we have things like planets and stars and animals and people and civilizations. So how was it that the universe went from this homogenous, boring place to what it is now. Yes, there's no doubt it's a lot better now than it was. So this, of course, is the arrow of time writ large. We're now talking about a cosmic scale. Let's just make the connection with daily life. Let's take an absolutely straightforward physical process that is easy to understand. Imagine that you have a box of gas with a membrane down the middle and supposing you've got oxygen on one side and nitrogen on the other side and you remove the membrane then the molecules soon become intermingled until you have a homogeneous mix of oxygen and nitrogen and you can't go backwards you can't say well i will wait for these two gases to unmix and then i'll insert the barrier it's a good example of what we would say is an irreversible process now, we know that in principle, the gases could unmix, but in practice, the initial condition that the gases were separated initially, it was a more ordered state initially, is what gives rise to that arrow of time. There's a more homely example if you take a pack of cards, freshly bought, arranged in suit and numerical order, and you shuffle them, they become more jumbled. And you shuffle them again, and they're still jumbled. So they've gone from ordered to jumbled, if you keep on shuffling for a stupendous amount of time, you might eventually shuffle them, well, it will eventually shuffle them back into suit in numerical order. So there's nothing intrinsic about the shuffling process. 
to give you the error of time. It's all down to the initial conditions that the cards were ordered initially. So those are sort of everyday type examples. But you're soon led, of course, to the initial conditions for the universe as a whole. The entire universe is on a one-way slide from a state of more order to less order. This was discovered in the middle of the 19th century by a number of physicists involved in thermodynamics. People often quote Helmholtz or Kelvin or Maxwell. But the notion that the universe as a whole has an arrow of time and it's sliding towards a final state, they used to call it the heat death of the universe, where thermodynamic equilibrium would be reached and nothing of interest would happen thereafter. That formed the backdrop to our understanding of cosmology from the middle of the 19th century. Well, then along came the Big Bang in the 20th century, and the rules of the game changed a bit, but not totally. So we still think that the universe started in an ordered state, and it becomes more and more disordered over time. But this is where it gets a little bit subtle, because, as you remarked, if you go back to a period about 300,000, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, it looks like the entire universe is in a state of thermodynamic equilibrium. The cosmic background radiation, which is our best way of understanding the early universe, has been mapped to extraordinary precision. And the distinctive thing about it is that the spectrum of that radiation is what we call black body. That is, it has all the hallmarks of a system which has reached thermodynamic equilibrium at a common temperature. In fact, it's the best known example. You can't do it in the lab as well as the universe has done it. So when we look at that radiation, we're looking back at what the universe was like a few hundred thousand years after the beginning, and it was clearly in a state of thermodynamic equilibrium. So that looks like a paradox, because if the arrow of time is explained by saying the universe starts off in disequilibrium, in an ordered state, like the unmixed gases or the ordered cards, and then slides towards disorder, how do we go from a state of thermodynamic equilibrium just after the Big Bang to the disequilibrium that we see here today? Well, that's a paradox that has been around some decades, and it's, it's very easily resolved. The thermodynamic equilibrium I'm talking about is the equilibrium between matter and radiation. All the cosmic material was in equilibrium with this heat radiation, which forms now the cosmic microwave background, and at a common temperature at about 380,000 years up till then after the Big Bang. To a first approximation, there are some subtleties about neutrinos and things we don't need to get into. But of course, that's only part of the story. The real source of this arrow of time, the real source of the cosmic order, the disequilibrium in the early universe, is gravitation. And this is where it gets a bit counterintuitive. And if you imagine a box of gas, I've talked about this, let's think of a, a slightly different experiment. You've got this time a box of gas, just all one type, say oxygen, and all the molecules are in one part of the box, all together in a, in a cluster in the middle. Imagine that you confined it by a smaller box inside, and then you open that. What happens? The molecules all rush out until they fill the bigger box, and they come into equilibrium that way. And so what happens in everyday thermodynamics in the lab is that gases tend to go from more clustered to less clustered states. They expand out into a vacuum. That's the, the process. But now imagine that we're talking not about molecules of gas, but stars. Then we have to take into account gravitation. And then you might very well see the reverse. You might see a whole lot of stars all spread out, but under their mutual gravitation, they fall together and form a cluster. So gravity goes the wrong way. It goes backwards. There are some other great examples of that. For example, when a satellite is orbiting the Earth and it loses energy because of atmospheric drag, it actually speeds up, goes faster and faster. I'll give you another example. Think of the sun. If by some magic we could extract all of the heat energy from the sun in an instant, the sun would shrink, collapse under its own weight, and it would get much hotter. 
So gravitating systems, as they radiate, they get hotter, whereas non-gravitating systems, when they radiate, they get cooler. Technically, we say they have a negative specific heat. The best known example of that is Stephen Hawking's quantum black hole. Black holes are not totally black. According to Hawking, they emit radiation and they get hotter as they emit energy. So gravitation goes back to front. And that's the key to understanding the origin of the arrow of time. The universe started out in a gravitationally smooth state, not totally smooth, but uh, much smoother than now. And then over time, it's become clumpier and clumpier as matter has aggregated to form galaxies and stars and so on. The end state of that successive aggregation is the black hole. So the black hole represents the sort of final triumph of gravitation, the highest entropy state of a gravitating system. But when stuff is smoothed out, that's a low entropy state. So smoothness in the early universe, which you alluded to, comes in two varieties. There's the smoothness of matter and radiation, which represents high entropy. And then there's the smoothness of gravitation, which represents low entropy. And gravitation wins when you put the numbers in. It overwhelms everything else. And so it's to the initial gravitational smoothness of the universe we attribute the source of time's arrow, which is still with us today. The universe is still becoming more and more clumpy, more and more crinkly, and will go on doing so into the future. In other words, the seeming paradox that I had asked you about a few minutes ago can be resolved by the fact that naively one might not take into account gravity's effect on the universe's total entropy, whereas when you take gravity into account, the universe was in fact in a low entropy gravitational state, even if the entropy of matter and radiation was high. And then eventually, as you were saying, gravity basically wins the day. And when you run the numbers, overall entropy is still going up. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. When you take into account the gravitational degrees of freedom, they're in a low entropy state, the matter degrees of freedom in a high entropy state, but not, not a maximum entropy. So as the universe expands, the constraints change. And so that means that it's possible if you take a region of the universe, uh, which will expand to form a region we now see, and then you look at the entropy of the matter and the radiation in that, you might say, well, it was in equilibrium, it must be a maximum entropy, but no, because the universe expands, it was at a local maximum, but that doesn't mean it can't get bigger when the universe expands. And this is exactly the same way that you could have a gas confined by a piston, and it could be at a uniform temperature, maximum entropy, and then you withdraw the piston rapidly, and the gas will rush after it, and it will eventually reach a higher entropy state. So these things, you can't because in the universe, we can't separate the gravity out from the matter and the radiation. We have to see the total picture. And then it all makes sense. But of course, there's still some unfinished business, because we have to ask, well, why was the universe in this smooth gravitational state initially? And that's a whole different line of inquiry. But the, the short answer to your question, how has it happened, is that how has the present state of a time asymmetry been achieved? And the answer is because the universe started out in this gravitationally low entropy state. So moving across the universe, as it were, from the beginning of the universe to the universe's fate, you had mentioned the universe's eventual heat death. Now, is that baked in purely from, as you were talking about, the second law of thermodynamics that entropy will always increase? Or are there any other possibilities for the ultimate fate of the universe based on maybe principles of which we're not yet aware or something? Well, there's always scope for things of which we're not aware, but the point about modern cosmology versus the 19th century version, which simply had everything running down and reaching equilibrium, is that the universe is not static, it's expanding, and, and that's, of course, the key to a lot of what's going on. But the question is, will it go on expanding forever? Will it collapse to a big crunch? Will it expand faster and faster and destroy itself in what's sometimes called a big rip? There's a whole lot of different possible outcomes. And if this happens within, say, a few billion years, maybe even a few trillion years, then that will dominate the final outcome. It's only if the universe goes on expanding forever and ever 
at a diminishing rate that we recover something like the 19th century heat death. So, for example, if everything collapses to a big crunch, say, in 100 billion years, then there won't be time for the universe to reach thermodynamic equilibrium before that happens, before it's overwhelmed. Or if it reaches a big rip, same reason. If the universe should go on expanding at a slower and slower rate, then possibly you would approach, you can do the calculations, I've done them, a lot of people have done them, try to figure out what will things look like arbitrarily far in the future and you get sort of cold dark emptiness there are a lot of processes that you have to look at but today it's usual to say that the universe isn't going to go on expanding at a slower and slower rate it's actually speeding up in the rate of its expansion it's dominated by what we call dark energy which means it's expanding more or less exponentially and then we're led to a rather different type of heat death because if this goes on forever, and of course we don't know it will, but if it does, then the universe will empty out because a universe that expands at an exponential rate has an event horizon, which means that, say, some distant galaxy which goes across that horizon would forever lose contact with us. We would never ever see that galaxy again. And over time, all of the other galaxies that wouldn't merge with the Milky Way, would disappear across that horizon. And so we'd just be left with something like a very aging Milky Way and otherwise emptiness. And then you think, well, what will happen to the Milky Way? And uh, if you go to the very far future, well, there will be black holes, but the black holes will evaporate by the Hawking process. The matter that doesn't fall into black holes may not be totally stable. Eventually, protons will decay by one process or another. And so you just end up with the products of these decays, which is uh, ultimately just photons, gravitons, maybe neutrinos. And all of these things will then go across the horizon of any given point. And so what you then got is basically just total emptiness. And you might think, well, that's the ultimate heat death of the universe because it's just zero temperature empty space expanding at an exponential rate. That's not quite the end of the story because we know that there is a quantum vacuum and for this type of exponential space called de Sitter space there's a temperature associated with it. It's incredibly low, 10 to the minus 30 degrees or something. And you could say well that is the modern version of the heat death. It's just a uniform temperature exponentially expanding space at this incredibly low temperature and that really is the end of everything forever and ever depressing in a way again there are caveats around that because some people have suggested what are often called boltzmann brains they say well if there is a uniform temperature background then there can be statistical fluctuations that will occur and if you have an infinite amount of time available then these fluctuations might bring into being an observer who would exist fleetingly in this background and that this would just go on forever and ever. So the heat death is accompanied by an endless number of uh, transient observers. That's a whole different game and some people object to that on philosophical grounds, some people on scientific grounds. But what I've just described to you is the closest thing that modern cosmology has to the 19th century version of the heat death. It sounds like we are still definitely not sure how the universe will end, even if the second law of thermodynamics ends up holding, regardless of our future theories. That's right. And you see, what I've described to you, this rather depressing, exponentially expanding space with this tiny temperature and maybe a few bolts from brains popping up, that's on the assumption that the dark energy is absolutely strictly constant in its value. This dark energy is the thing that's driving the exponential expansion. It's a type of anti-gravity. And the point about anything being constant, in science uh, you claim something's constant. I mean there are always error bars on what you can measure. And so it would be impossible to know whether it might be very, very close to being constant, but might vary over time, over some immense period of time, trillions upon trillions upon trillions of years, 
you know, it might get slightly bigger or slightly smaller, and that would totally change the final outcome. So the difficulty about talking about the infinite future is you have to assume that you know precisely all of the quantities that are relevant, and that there's nothing you've overlooked, that there isn't some really unusual, rare process which, given an infinite amount of time, is going to come to dominate. So there's a lot of hand-waving, I think, involved in any prediction of the infinite future. But that's different if we say the universe will end at a finite period in, in the future. If it's going to hit a big crunch, for example, you, you might be able to make that prediction and test it and get good evidence that it is going to collapse to a big crunch. And then you don't have an infinite, the luxury of an infinite future to wonder if something is going to change that. Any universe that is going to go on expanding forever, you have that difficulty about predicting the far future. So zooming in from the entire universe, we've touched on black holes a little bit. How do the physics of black holes present the challenge to traditional views about time and irreversibility? Well, the black hole is a very good example of this uh, irreversibility because if something falls into a black hole, it doesn't get out again. And so that looks pretty irreversible. And in the early 1970s, it was very clear that there was a close analogue between the laws of black hole dynamics and the laws of thermodynamics. The example that I most impresses itself on me but when I learned about it in the early 70s was Hawking's area theorem, the two black holes that collide and merge. The final area can't be less than the sum of the areas of the two black holes that fell into each other. And so that's just like entropy in the second law of thermodynamics. And so the area of black holes was always tipped by that analogy to play the role of entropy. But it wasn't until 1974 that Hawking applied quantum mechanics to black holes and then was able to make that more than an analogy, uh, was able to say that the area of a black hole really is its entropy with an appropriate constant in front of it uh, to convert the units. And so after 1974, black holes could be incorporated in the laws of thermodynamics in a rather straightforward way. You'd have entropy of ordinary matter and the entropy of black holes. And when matter fell into black holes, there was a trade-off energy and uh, entropy. And you could write down the laws of thermodynamics in a very straightforward way. And it all looked pretty normal. And then going the other way, if black holes emit heat radiation, some heat comes out, uh, they lose some energy as a result, get smaller, they shrink. As I explained earlier, their temperature goes up, but it all can be fitted together very nicely. And so uh, Jacob Bekenstein proposed what he called a generalized second law of thermodynamics that would add to the ordinary entropy of the world, the entropy, the gravitational entropy of black holes as determined by their surface area. The bigger the area, the bigger the entropy of the black holes. And so on the face of it, everything seemed quite uh, straightforward. But then a problem was obviously lurking because I said earlier, well, you throw something into a black hole, it's gone, you can't get it back again. That's a good example of irreversibility uh, and a good example of the rise in entropy because the black hole area goes up as a result of its mass going up. If a star if a black hole swallows a star, its mass increases by roughly the mass of the star and its area goes up by the square of the total mass. And so that's all pretty straightforward. However, if you take the Hawking effect seriously and take it to its ultimate extreme, is that black hole going to evaporate and disappear totally? And if that happens, can the information that fell into the black hole in the first place ever get out again? And that's often called the black hole information paradox. And vast numbers of papers have been written on it. I remember myself discussing it with Stephen Hawking in the late 1970s. And he was of the view at that stage that if something fell into a black hole, it really was irreversibly erased from the universe. It was always supposed that at the center of a black hole was a singularity that's like an edge or a boundary of space-time where the space-time curvature would become infinite, and the, whatever fell in, its destiny was to disappear into that singularity and leave the physical universe totally. So it was an absolute eraser of any object or any information. And then in later years, 
Stephen did a bit of a U-turn and said that somehow that information might get back out again through subtle quantum correlations or something in this radiation that he predicted. And I think the matter is unresolved to this day. The fashion has swung, the pendulum, fashion pendulum swings back and forth in science a lot. And I think it has sort of swung to the point of view that black holes are not totally irreversible, that they may scramble information, but that at the level of quantum mechanics, if you get down to that fine level of detail, that it comes back out again, uh, there is a type of reversibility. I'm sort of sitting on the fence. I still have that early notion that there is something like a singularity at the center of the black hole uh, that would swallow that information. But it's important that we distinguish here between we're talking about what is often called fine-grained information or fine-grained entropy. We're talking about if you knew every last little detail of a quantum system, every phase of the wave function, everything completely may not be lost. But if you do any sort of coarse graining, like you do when we've been talking about boxes of gas or the general second law of thermodynamics in the, the usual way of talking about it, the entropy of gas and so on, but that's a coarse grain view of the world. And it remains true that at a coarse grain level, black holes are irreversible, just like uh, boxes of gas. So how did scientists react to Hawking's initial 1974 lecture on Hawking radiation? Were they excited? Did they think that this was just ridiculous and could never be experimentally corroborated, for example? How did people react? Well, I can tell you how this scientist reacted. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember this event very well, not just because of Hawking's lecture. And I knew Stephen, I'd uh, known him for a few years at that stage. Uh, I knew he was going to speak, but because I drove down from London, where I was living, to this uh, lecture took place just outside Oxford, and I had a, a carload of people. I had with me Abdus Salam sitting in the passenger seat. Of course, he later got the Nobel Prize for his work on the unification of weak and electromagnetic interaction. And I chatted to him about what he was going to talk about, and he said he thought protons might be unstable and might decay. And that was new to me in the in the early 70s, you know, that was a pretty revolutionary idea. I remember being a bit skeptical about that, but of course that became a, a big topic uh, subsequently. And then I had a couple of my colleagues from King's College London sitting in the back, both interesting in their own ways. And so we had an interesting conversation and then there was some security issues uh, trying to get into this facility, which was a government run lab. And so all of this was impressed on me. But the actual lecture itself, I vividly remember, so I was sitting somewhere near the back. In those days, Stephen could vocalize, but it was very hard to understand him. I mean, I'd spoken to him a lot over the years. I used to find that over the telephone, I could understand what he was saying, but when it was sort of in person, it was very hard to follow, but uh, he heroically insisted on giving lectures in his own voice. And Many was the occasion, and it may be that this was one I remember, where he said, if anybody doesn't understand what I'm saying, please stop me. And that's the last thing I understood. And so that meant it was very difficult on the spur of the moment to evaluate this claim that black holes are not black but would evaporate. And he handed out some notes, which was very helpful, but of course trying to speed read these notes. And this showed a diagram of a star that collapses to a singularity and then a horizon forms and then there are sort of what we call null rays, if you like light rays, that would go through the star, through the middle of it, come out the other side and eventually become the event horizon. And then, as you know, we learned in subsequent months and, and years, something called a Bogolubov transformation between the in-states and the out-states as a technical way of talking about how the collapse of the star would disrupt the quantum vacuum. But all that was a bit too much to take in, you know, sitting, trying to pay attention to, to the lecture. And so the, the upshot was he announced that black holes would explode. And I, I remember coming out next to Roger Penrose and I said, well, what did you make of that? And he said, well, it contradicts three things that Stephen has always claimed. One is that there are microscopic black holes. 
The other is the black holes only get bigger. Can't remember what the third one was. So he said, I think, you know, if Stephen is claiming something that contradicts three things he said before, it's got to be right. But, of course, it took a long while before, certainly it took me a few months before I understood fully about this Bogolubov transformation. And the way I came to understand it was not from doing the calculation with black holes, but finding an analogy with an accelerating mirror is a much easier thing to wrap your head around. If you imagine that you've got a reflecting surface and it ac accelerates and any light that is directed to the mirror will be blue shifted and if the mirror is rushing away from you it'll be red shifted and you can use that to sort of mimic what happens when a star collapses to form a black hole. It's a sort of escalating red shift and if you apply quantum field theory to this retreating mirror, then lo and behold, for a particular simple trajectory I discovered, you find that you get a thermal flux of radiation. And that was for me the aha moment. Now I see. And of course, the critical thing behind this Hawking effect is not that it's a black hole, it's that the star collapses, it implodes catastrophically and disrupts the quantum vacuum forever and ever. So it's like the grin of the Cheshire cat. It lives on for trillions upon trillions of years, that initial disruption. If you don't have that initial collapse, that's what gives you the arrow of time. Then there is no, if the black hole is there, if it's eternal, there is no arrow of time. There's no flow of Hawking radiation away from the black hole. It's a time asymmetry. And I was skeptical initially because I'd looked at quantum black holes myself a couple of years earlier and looked at the static case. You just take a black hole and you do quantum field theory around it and the vacuum remains the vacuum. You don't get any flux of radiation because the, by definition a f an outward flux of radiation is time asymmetric. It breaks the time symmetry. The Schwarzschild black hole, the solution that we all knew and loved for decades, has no arrow of time attached to it and so there is no radiation. It's all in the breaking of the time asymmetry by the collapse of the star. It took me a few weeks, if not months, to finally come around and see that is absolutely right. Some other theoretical physicists took longer. Some never accepted it. They felt that this was, you know, some sort of mathematical sleight of hand or something. It's a result of confusing two different vacuum states. But I think, by and large, the physics community now accepts that this result, because it's so simple, and it touches on so many different branches of physics. It's sort of got the smell of truth to it, even if you can pick holes in any particular mathematical construction that predicts it. That's my story over the years. As I say, vivid memories of that remarkable lecture, which in retrospect, you know, I went away uh, really rather thinking of Salam's decaying protons. I didn't think too much about Hawking's result for a while. I imagine it happens a decent amount. It's always easy to look in hindsight at, oh, such and such idea. We can now see, obviously, how revolutionary it is now, you know, looking back. But maybe at the time, sometimes it can be harder to tell. So that's why I was curious. Yes, yes. Hindsight's a great thing, but <laughs> uh, investing in the stock market. Yeah, we're not going to talk about the stock market today. So sticking with the theme of information, but switching far away from black holes, could you explain Maxwell's particular thought experiment that seemed to show a way around the second law of thermodynamics? Yes, so, so a very profound result was produced by Maxwell in what was no more than, at the time, a letter to a friend. Uh, it seemed to be sort of, you know, he'd had one glass of wine too many or something the night before and jotted down this idea. And the thought experiment goes back to this box of gas we've been talking about. So now imagine you've got a box of gas with a membrane. Earlier I was talking about oxygen on the left and nitrogen on the right, and that would do. But let's keep it simpler and imagine it's the same gas both sides, but it's hotter on one side than the other. And so the molecules are rushing around faster, say on the left, than they are on the right on average. Then imagine that we have this membrane down the middle and this little hole in the membrane and under those circumstances very slowly the gas will diffuse from the left to the right and the right to the left but over a long period of time will come into equilibrium but now imagine that there's a diminutive being which came to be known as Maxwell's demon who can operate a shutter and allow molecules to pass through the hole or not 
according to how they were moving. And now we can imagine that the demon lets the faster moving molecules on the right of the box go through into the hotter left part of the box and vice versa. The slower moving ones from the left go through to the right. Then that temperature difference will get greater as a result of that sifting or sorting of molecules. Because at a uniform temperature, the molecules don't all move at the same speed. There's a whole distribution of velocities. And so even in a cooler gas, there will be some molecules moving faster than there are on the other side and the warmer gas. And if they're let through, they will increase the energy on the left side and decrease it on the right side. So the temperature difference will get greater over time. And so what is happening is that the demon is increasing the thermodynamic disequilibrium between the two sides of the box. Uh, whereas the second law of thermodynamics says that left to itself, it should decrease. And this comes about entirely because the demon is using information about the molecular motions in order to defy the second law of thermodynamics. So this looked like a paradox. It remained like an inconvenient truth at the heart of physics uh, for really many decades. And there are other variants of uh, Maxwell's demon, but the essential idea is that an information gathering system at a molecular scale is able to decrease the entropy of a system by appropriate manipulations. Now, of course, it was very much a thought experiment at the time because nobody could really imagine having a nanoscale technology, but now we do have nanotechnology and people have built Maxwell demons and you can really do this, what I've been describing, not quite with boxes of gas, but you can manipulate degrees of freedom and turn information into negative entropy or reduce the entropy by making use of information. Another way of explaining it is saying information is a type of fuel. And let me just give a homely analogy. So it's often said the second law of thermodynamics tells you that heat flows from hot to cold. Well, I have a refrigerator in my kitchen and it does exactly the opposite. It takes heat from the cold interior of the refrigerator and puts it out into the warm kitchen. How does it do that? Well, the answer is it's plugged into an electric socket and it expends energy in order to be able to transfer the heat from cold to hot. And that's standard part of thermodynamics, that if, if you have some free energy available, you can drive the system in the opposite way to diminish the entropy inside the fridge, increase it outside. And if you put all the numbers in, you find that the overall entropy of the universe goes up, but locally it might go down, and that's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and it's explained by the fact that I'm paying electricity bills. But the demon can achieve the same effect without paying any electricity bills. The demon's not wired up to the national grid to operate. The demon operates with, in principle, zero energy expenditure, yet still achieves this goal. And the demon, instead of using electricity to reduce the entropy, is using information. So information's like electricity, it's like a fuel. Information as fuel. And that's now well established in physics, that information can serve as a type of fuel. And you might be thinking, well, what does this do for the arrow of time and the heat death of the universe and so on? Is all that now back in the melting pot? Well, no, it's not, because again, you have to look at the total picture. If the demon operates in such a way as to reduce the entropy of physical system, then by using information, that information has to be stored and there's got to be some device that manipulates it. And people build these, these things in the lab. They'll build a device that might involve an external computer or just a few degrees of freedom in the system. But basically, the information has to be stored and then deployed. And if you want to do it again to reduce the entropy still more, you then have to erase the register that stores that information so you can repeat the process. And the act of erasure of the memory is what gives you back the second law of thermodynamics because erasing information carries an entropy cost which is at least as great as the entropy reduction the demon has achieved. So honor is satisfied, so to speak. Uh, Maxwell's demon does work. It, they do exist now and they do what uh, Maxwell had envisaged. But when you take into account the total system, then the second law of thermodynamics still wins out 
there's still an error of time and the entropy of the whole universe is still going up. But what is interesting to contemplate is, I just mentioned that nanotechnology in the last few years has enabled people to build real Maxwell demons. Well, it turns out nature has been building them for billions of years. They're called living organisms and inside our cells, there are little Maxwell demons, uh, lots of different types of them, chuntering away, carrying out the business of life, playing the margins of the second law of thermodynamics. They never defy it, but they play those margins. They're operating very, very close to the limit, some of them, very close to the limit of the idealized Maxwell demon. They're gathering information and manipulating uh, microscopic degrees of freedom and achieving some of the miracle that, that we call life. The example I love most, although this one, in terms of efficiency, is not the best Maxwell demon that we have inside us, but it's a sort of dramatic one. These are molecules that open and close gates, just like Maxwell originally envisaged. There are holes in the wires in our brains. These are axons that connect neurons together. These are long tubes. And there are holes in the membranes that surround those tubes that are gated, so they, the gate can be opened or closed, by little demon type molecules and that's the way that nerve impulses propagate by a sort of succession of openings and closings that allow sodium ions and potassium ions to go in or out from these axons and so this is all well studied and pretty well understood and effectively these are Maxwell demons operating at that level and to give you some idea of just how good they are at combating the laws of thermodynamics that only want to make things degenerate and heat up, waste heat. Our brains have the power of a megawatt supercomputer, but they operate with an energy source about the equivalent a uh, rather dim light bulb. And so that's a result of the extraordinary thermodynamic efficiency that is achieved by demonic-like molecules in our heads. As is often the case, but not always, evolution discovered Maxwell's demon before we did. That's absolutely right. I mean, it's often said when you look at biology that nothing that humans have invented has not been somehow discovered biologically before. Some people say, what about wheels? Well, but there's certainly things, rotors and things like that in biology. And it's a curious thought that I've had for some years. Well, what about quantum computing? You know, the latest hot topic in human technology, if we can build a quantum computer, might nature have built a quantum computer? Might there be quantum computing going on in biology? Some people think, yes, there might be. I'm sitting on the fence on that one. It may be quantum computing is the first human technology that is not found in nature. But it's sort of a curious thought that the evolution's had billions of years. If quantum computing can give you all of the advantages that scientists today, scientists and engineers claim we will get from the quantum computer revolution, then maybe nature did get there first, but we have yet to see evidence for it. Well, I think I disagree with you that we haven't invented things, or evolution hasn't. For example, going back to what we were talking about earlier, evolution never created a stock market. We did. <laughs> well... Well, it's a lottery. It certainly rolls the genetic dice uh, a lot. And, you know, I'm not sure of, you're not gambling with money, but you're gambling with, with lives or something of that sort. But, but you're right, nothing quite, quite like the actual stock market. Maybe that's a topic for another day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to finish out, I, I want to talk about more of a sociological issue than a scientific one. I wonder, you've had a very productive career in science. How has the research environment around you in theoretical physics changed since you got started? What has improved? What has gotten worse? And if something has gotten worse, do you think that this is a reversible change? Those are very interesting questions. And I often think myself uh, about those changes. One thing that certainly got better is that the place of women and ethnic minorities has improved, not nearly as much as I would like, but it is a lot better than it was when I was a student, say. And if you just look at the numbers, the funding has improved, of course, tremendously. 
Now, the thing that hasn't changed is there's never enough money. So there are always students and postdocs can't get jobs, you know, it's tight and, and so on. And you think, oh, well, if only they would double the budget, uh, there'd be money for everybody. But the truth is that the scientific community has grown enormously during my career. And so there are more scientists working on more things today. And of course, uh, there's more money for it. Uh, it becomes diminishing returns. You throw money at it, uh, you attract more people, and there'll still be those who can't find jobs. But there's no doubt that there's a lot more being spent today than there was. In terms of the culture of research, you see, I've been very lucky because my interests, as will be obvious from our conversation, are very broad, but also rather deep and abstract. I often say the great thing about being a theoretical physicist is that your research moves at the speed of thought. If I was an uh, experimental physicist working in, I don't know, atomic collisions or something, I would probably have to spend my entire career working with one or two different types of apparatus and uh, just doing different experiments. But I can go wherever my interests take me, and that's a tremendous thing. I've been allowed to get away with that. I'm not sure that the current research environment is quite as tolerant as it was for me. That is to say, a lot of young people today will come to me and they say, well, how do I have a career working on the sort of stuff you do? That seems really exciting and, and it would be great to do that. And what I always say to them is, well, you're going to have a lot of trouble if you decide for your PhD, say, or as a postdoc, well, I'll work on the arrow of time. I and mean, that's what we've been talking about. Very difficult to make a career if that's what you do. Chances are you'll have a much better career if you focus 50% of your time on something absolutely mainstream where you can get papers published, uh, build up a reputation in the community. And then this stuff that really interests you, regard that as, you know, a bit of a hobby. And over time, if you build up enough reputation and get job security and so on, well, then you can indulge that hobby a bit more. But I think there's less tolerance now for working on sort of way out of ideas or blue sky research or whatever than there, there was uh, when I was younger. And maybe that's uh, just a function of it was a smaller scientific community that could accommodate a few sort of oddballs like me. But now with a bigger community, people are expected to sort of join the mainstream more. I think it's got tougher. I work with some young people, or younger people, who are able to look at these big questions, foundational questions of science. But I think in every case, they've got this sort of you know, mainstream work running in parallel. But those are, are my main observations. I mean, there'll be some other small things. Looking back, I think maybe my career has been coloured very much by the growth of universities. So when I, so I was a student at University College London and then postdoc in Cambridge and then a lecturer at King's College London, in those days when I went to university in Britain, at least it was about 5% of the population. So it was an, an odd thing to do. Very few of my friends went to university. My parents could understand what I was doing. So there was a sort of elitism that went with it. Now the universities are greatly expanded. There are many more students. It's become more of an industry. I'm fortunate that I've been able to work within university environments, particularly the one I'm in now, Arizona State University, that has allowed me to still work on these foundational things. But the character of universities has changed an awful lot. So whereas I think back in the 60s and 70s, we thought, well, you know, we're in this sort of closed community doing stuff that mostly the public won't be interested in and it's a bit way out, but it's important to us. All that has changed now. Universities have become more open, more egalitarian, less elitist, better in, in many ways, but certainly a different type of working environment from what I was used to back in the, in the 60s and 70s. Do you think it's possible that the universities will evolve towards being more tolerant of people working on, as you were describing them, pie in the sky or blue sky ideas? I always felt that we should be going in the other direction, that the universities, seeing as they now cater for the vast 
well, not the vast majority of the population, but a sizable fraction of the population, maybe half or something, go to university. What are they doing? Mostly they are looking to get a qualification that will help them get a decent job. And I always felt it's enormously important that young people should be properly educated and trained for the workforce. And Britain used to have a very good polytechnics that did exactly that. And the universities were, in those days, were really more places where the people focused on research and they didn't worry too much about whether the students would get jobs. And so if uh, you wanted to study Egyptology or cosmology or something like that, unlikely to get you employment afterwards, but that was okay because it was restricted to this smaller fraction of the population. When the universities expanded to sort of take all comers and teach all subjects and really saw themselves more as training institutions for the job market, it seemed to me that we ought to create another type of institution which m might not be a university. It might be like the Max Planck Institutes in uh, Germany, for example, uh, and there are one or two in Britain, and there are some here in the United States. But these are really research institutes that focus primarily on these foundational issues at the, the cutting edge. If you ask me, could we redesign the whole system, I would have a few more things like the Santa Fe Institute for the Study of Complexity or the Kavli Institute in Santa Barbara for uh, theoretical physics or the Perimeter Institute uh, in Ontario uh, for theoretical physics. I'd have a few more of those and probably leave the universities to be more geared towards the job market. But, you know, we, these things are political and, and also what suits me may not suit uh, many of my colleagues, many of whom love to be involved with students doing everyday subjects and going on to do uh, everyday type jobs uh, and they get great satisfaction from being involved with those students and they don't want to be in some sort of rarefied atmosphere where we only worry about things like the origin of the universe. So it takes all sorts. Right, which is itself an argument for a diversity of institutional approaches, I suppose. It is, and I think there's probably not enough diversity for my satisfaction. You see, I'm okay because I've steered through these changes and have managed to, to follow my own interests and inclinations. But if I was starting out again now, as a young person, I really wanted to go into the t sort of topics that we've been talking about in the last hour or so. Not too sure where I would, uh, would go or what my chances would be of a successful career doing that. Right. Well, it'll be very interesting to see how universities continue to change over the coming years. So, Paul, I really appreciate your time. This has been an extremely informative conversation. Uh, absolutely. I've enjoyed it a great deal. Thank you, Logan, for your interest. And I think we covered a lot of uh, fascinating topics. Yes. As promised, we ran the gamut. Thanks, Paul. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. That was Paul Davis in conversation with Logan Chipkin. Davis is, of course, a famous popular science author, in addition to being a renowned physicist. And on the podcast page, fqxi.org slash community slash podcast, we'll be linking to some books in which he touches on these topics, the mind of God, the demon in the machine, and what's eating the universe. If you're interested in the end of the universe, a bit gruesome I know, then check out the link to my podcast chat with astrophysicist Katie Mack about her book, The End of Everything. That edition also has more about the use of information as fuel and the role of information in evolution. And you can also find links to FQXI's in-depth report on the nature of time by Kate Becker too, which explores many of these ideas. That's all for now. You can contact us by email at podcast at fqxi.org and you can reach us on Twitter at FQXI and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest at FQXI Physics. You'll even find us on LinkedIn as the Foundational Questions Institute. My goodness, we're getting everywhere. I dread to think where we will turn up next. Thank you for listening. I've been Zia Morali.